the evening. Um, my name is Johan Lidberg. Um, I teach um, in the School of Journalism in Australia and the Institute of Studies at Monash University. And um, of course, um, thanks for getting the question from Eva and the Centre to chair the second panel. Uh, I will start by, uh, I think, pose a few questions and then introduce the panel. Because following on from the first panel, um, there were a few things that, that popped up as I was listening, and really, what we're going to what we're going to ask ourselves in, in this panel, I think, is what makes the news and why. Because even if even if we have new media, even if we have bloggers and Twitter, it's pretty hard to report, you know, with context and 140 characters. But we still there are lots of new ways of publishing. But there is no way around the fact that it's all about the reach and the audience reach. So there is a difference between the film review, for instance who's got audience in the hundreds of thousands, compared to a blogger who's got 150 points. And so what makes you still matters, and I think will keep on mattering for a long time. Um, I will come back to this uh, question that I asked at the end of the last panel, you know, what the current image of Europe is in Australia. And, and I'm sure that the panelists have prepared their own uh, things here, but I, it's something to, to ponder, I think. And why do we have this image? of Europe and Australia. What's the reason for it? I think part of it, of course, you know, comes to what makes news. Um, but I'll introduce the, the panelists now and then I'll kick things off with a little um, anecdote, I think. So uh, to my far right here, we've got um, Dr. Patrick Kumandui from uh, the, um, uh, the, who teaches in the, uh, in the Monash um, uh, European Centre, correct, and he teaches and coordinates a, a, a variety of subjects including peace and security um, and the John Monet module on the European Union and the developing world as well as the European Union and world. Um, he's also a member of, or a participant in the transnational project um, after Lisbon, the EU as the exporter of values and norms through um, ASEM and co-researcher in the project communicating the European Union to Asia-Pacific challenges and opportunities, which incidentally Eva is also at the part of that project. And uh, Dr. Eva uh, Polonska um, lectures in the same um, centre at, at um, Murdoch and she obtained her PhD from the University of Melbourne where she studied media and the audiovisual policy of the European Union. And to my left is uh, Mr. Christopher Gomez, uh, the publisher of um, uh, Neos Cosmos, which is a, is it a Greek language? Um, no, bilingual. bilingual one, yeah, which is interesting. Um, so you can speak from that pers perspective. And to the far left is Mr. Matthew, or Matt Drummond, um, who um, uh, is reporting for the Australian Financial Review. Uh, Matthew's been with the Australian Financial Review since 2005. Writing, course and, uh, writing on courts and legal affairs, business and regulation of the finance sector. And Matthew is also a Walkley Award winner, so we've got a prominent um, company tonight. Uh, he was part of a team that got the Walkley for business journalism for the coverage of the collapse of stockbroker Opus Prime. And at the start of 2012, he moved to Paris, and he's been there for nine months um, as the um, Finn Reviews European correspondent, and recent, recently returned to Melbourne. So. And Matt can give us um, a double perspective. Really. Before I kick things off, and I'm going to start with you, Matt, and I've, I've told the panelists that we're going to try to keep the uh, talks fairly short so we can engage with questions because that was the most important, the um, interesting part, I think, of the previous um, panel that we had the questions. But I just want to, uh, I just want to, before I go to Matt, uh, tell you a little anecdote because I used to be in the reverse situation in 1994. I migrated to Australia from Sweden and I was then um, working as a freelance correspondent for European media and Scandinavian media. And uh, I suppose I was part of uh, supplying the Europeans with the, the um, image of Australia. And it was always a hard sell because there were the, tri the, the triple S and the C, that was the, the, as we called it, those stories. There were spider, snake, shark, and croc stories. <laughs> and for, for every single story that you know people like me wanted to do, you had to pay with three or four triple S and C stories. And I remember in the 1998 election, the One Nation election in Australia, which was, as you may remember, a big thing, and there had been pre previous... Um, previous elections in several of them in Europe with xenophobic parties, you know, on the rise and so on. So it was a pretty big thing. And I finally, after weeks, convinced the, um, the equivalent of, of uh, Radio National in, in Sweden to uh, um, uh, 
uh, to let me do this story. And at the end of it, when I'd done it, um, I said, so how many spider stories do I have to do? And I did five. <laughs> so Matthew, to choose first, uh, is this something that you experienced, but the other way around? Then? Exactly. I get asked all the time in France about the spiders and the snakes. And that seems to be the dominant um, perception of Australia. Um, uh, thank you for inviting me. Uh, I think uh, I'd like to start off by explaining how it was that I came to be working in Europe at the Financial Review. Um, but the Financial Review has not had a European correspondent for quite a few years, um, foreign correspondents. And one of those things that have been cut um, from newspapers a while ago. We used to have someone in London um, to explain to you why it is that you've got a 30-something-year-old who managed to work as a European correspondent in Paris, of all places. I'll explain that by saying uh, I was born in the late 1970s, which makes me a mix of Generation X and Generation Y. I have uh, traits of um, both generations, and like a typical Generation Y person, I decided to, uh, after years of working at the Fin Review, throw my job, say I was going to move to Paris and do my own thing. Um, luckily for me, the uh, sovereign debt crisis, when I hatched this idea, was in full swing, and work said, why don't you just stay there in Paris and work for us a couple of days a week? And write about uh, the European debt crisis, we'll call you European Correspondent, on the basis that you come back within a year. And as a person with some lingering Generation X characteristics in my personality, I felt a lot of compulsion and loyalty and gratefulness to my employer, <laughs> which is why, against all uh, bets, I actually did come back to Melbourne. Um, the Fin Review hopefully doesn't need too much explanation to you. It's one of two uh, national newspapers in Australia. It's got a very small circulation, um, 70,000. Small for a, a newspaper, perhaps, but tends to be read by people in the office towers that we have around us here. Um, obviously, it's a business newspaper, first and foremost. So our interest in Europe has tended to be around what is of interest from a business perspective in Australia. That means good stories about um, the GDP growth and rather about uh, the British royal family. Um, we, uh, European countries are not amongst the major trading partners of Australia. If you sort of rank them, you've got China up here, and then Japan, and then uh, you've got Singapore. And you don't, it's not until you get to the fifth place when you have um, Great Britain that you've got a European country. And then you've got to go down quite a few more rank, rankings on the ladder to get to the ninth place for Germany. So our coverage from a world perspective in the world section of the paper has always been dominated by what's happening in China and in the US where our stock markets tend to take their um, lead from. Um, of course, if you add up all the European countries themselves and come up with trade between Australia and the European Union, I think the European Union might even be Australia's single biggest trading partner, it might just clip um, uh, China. But from a news perspective, we still don't see the European Union as, uh, as a single block. It's very much a divided um, continent we tend to break Europe down to its parts, its national boundaries. And I think the sovereign debt crisis uh, has exaggerated, or not exaggerated, but it's meant that we see Europe even more than ever as um, individual countries, and we don't necessarily see it as a comprehensive or as a clear whole that's all sort of working with all bits moving in the same direction. Um, the sovereign debt crisis has fundamentally, I think, changed the way that we see Europe from a news perspective in Australia. Um, just to sort of uh, throw a few numbers at you, and I'll use my hands to help. Um, the, we all know that the, 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 the global financial crisis smashed the value of Australian equities. The um, S&P ASX 200 index used to be, it hit a, pop, a high point in 2007 of 6,800 points. So if we say that was up around here, at zero there, 6,800 is there. It fell by 50% in about a year. And then it started to climb again. And it got to a point of 5,000 points, up around here somewhere, in, um, it was April 2010. And from that point, it's just been bumbling along, doing nothing. It's, it's never actually got back to that 5,000 level. It's basically been going nowhere. And since um, April 2010, and as it happens, I think April 2010 is when history will probably date the beginning of the sovereign, European sovereign debt crisis. That's the month when Greece put its hand out for $45 billion, 45 billion euro loan from the EU, the, sort of the uh, credit rating agencies knocked down their um, ratings of Greek debt to, um, to uh, junk status. The, the sovereign debt crisis has had a fundamentally um, undermining role in confidence, business confidence around the world um, and in Australia. 
And so I think if I was to answer the question as to how um, we perceive Europe in our newspaper or what our readers would perceive of Europe given the diet of stories that we've fed up to them, it would be something like uh, it would be very much about the Eurozone, the 17 countries using the Euro. It would be um, uh, a monetary union that is badly designed. It would be a conception of a monetary union that's got fundamental birth defects um, of a group of countries who've got anemic growth, uh, GDP growth rates and no real uh, catalyst for um, any real change. Um, uh, a, a group of countries who, are, um, who, 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 who come together in a mind-boggling array of different institutions that Australians struggle to understand how they interact with each other, and of a group of um, politicians who, whether they are um, unable or unwilling or simple, simply incapable of fully grasping the situation and the scale of the problems before Europe to fix up the sovereign debt crisis, are unwilling to take those problems in hand and resolve them. Um, I think people, we can trust the way in which Europe has dealt with its sovereign debt crisis um, with what happened in the US where you've got the benefits of one country, one economy, and um, the treasurer of um, the, the, the Henry Paulson um, marched all the heads of um, the European, the, the Wall Street banks into his office and said, you're all going to take out of that money, and that's it, we're going to have a shock. And or, um, uh, approach, we're going to tell the markets that we'll do whatever it takes to fix the um, subprime collapse. In Europe, it took uh, over two years to get to that point where someone, and in Europe was the case of Mario Draghi, the head of the ECB, actually said the words, whatever it takes. And only now is there now a feeling that um, the sovereign debt crisis is moving into a much um, calmer uh, period, and perhaps, fingers crossed, it's behind us. Thinking about the challenges in terms of how we represent Europe, um, uh, I think there are so many uh, pieces that come together in the European sovereign debt crisis. It is, it is such, it's been such an enormous conundrum um, that it's been very difficult for media outlets to construct a narrative that guides their readers through what's important and what's not and what the future is going to be. Um, you think about all the changes that have to happen to economies, to regulations, to how things function in so many countries in Europe. You think about the elections that constantly come up and the question of whether it's the same political leaders have been calling the shots are going to be there next week. You think about the tensions between the different political leaders and relations between Angela Merkel and Francois Hollande and whether they can get the accord together to, to, to steer Europe forwards. It's very, very difficult from the distance of Australia to actually work out what is important and what is not, which tends to mean that whatever happens that just looks terribly bad tends to make it in the newspapers. And I think often the way in which the media represent Europe um, from outside Europe is very, very hard to put context and it's very, very hard to have um, the right judgment about which things ultimately uh, really matter and which things don't. Um, to, um, obviously there are problems as well because we don't have um, uh, European correspondents. I was very much a one-off, um, being a European correspondent actually in continental Europe. Newspapers in Australia, they do have European correspondents, um, I think tend to be in London. They are all in London, which means they're in a new year, which tends to be more cynical um, of Europe. Um, they, are, they can't help but be infected, I think, these journalists by more um, uh, a sense that the European project is not as successful as Europeans themselves think it is. Um, and also we tend to take wire copy, which tends to be from British papers, um, and they are also affected by that just general level of cynicism that if you cross the channel and go into Europe, you see a very different way of seeing the world. Um, finally, uh, if I was, one of the points I was asked to raise was to talk about was uh, feedback from readers. And after nine months, if I think about the story that got the most um, attention from readers. It, after everything we wrote about Greece, um, Spain, France, Germany, it was the article that I did on um, how nice it is to go shopping in Parisian food markets um, <laughs> and how different food markets um, reflect different characteristics of the of the quartier or the arrondissement in which they're found, and um, what a lovely place it is to be in Paris. So maybe I should have listened to my Generation Y instincts and throw it all in and become a travel writer, at least I would have known that my stories would be read. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.
last point, and I might take the indulgence to ask one question from the panelists as a follow-on, but I think that the point that Matt is making, that it's the, it shows the extreme importance of having eyes on the ground. So you, have, you get a completely different set of eyes on the ground if you're in London as compared to France or Berlin or anywhere in continental Europe. And if we don't have that, then we are worse off for it as, as the audience and the readers and the, and the public. And unfortunately, as you know, news organisations, when they're going to cut, they cut the foreign bureaus first, which is really dumb. So Matt, just one question to you that, that came out of your talk, and that is, how did, how did, what was the Australian and the Finn Review's uh, image of Europe before the debt crisis? What was it then? Uh, very much it was uh, a place of, um, of uh, it, it, it probably would have been present more in the lifestyle section of the newspaper as a place where it's um, where you can have very lovely holidays, a place where the luxury goods sector, there's a lot of interest in the luxury goods market and how, how luxury good companies like um, LV <coughs> and to China. Um, it would be um, sort of more of the quirky stories, um, which would have been picked up in the newspapers, but not the actual uh, sort of hard business stories or GDP stories because we tend to look to uh, China or um, America for those kind of stories. So I think it was certainly present, but more in a lifestyle travel um, section, which is a real shame, which we talk about later, mm -hmm. because of all the good things that happen in Europe. Um, the things are very, very interesting that we probably should be doing here in Australia. But that's where it was confined to. So from lifestyle to do doom and gloom, and then we'll see if we come back to lifestyle again. Yeah, but do you want to go next? I really want to go between the journalists and over to the academics. Are you okay? Can I do? Yeah. What you've been yeah. Saying, absolutely. Please, please, Patrick. You, oh, you don't mind if I stand. No, no, no. You do. Well, you can stand on your head if you want. Yeah. <laughs> Extremely interesting there, Matt. Thank you very much for that presentation. I guess that's the reason why I jumped in to say, let me uh, speak first. Uh, because largely uh, of what you just uh, uh, mentioned here. So uh, I will present the results uh, of the project that you've been working on, that is the EU in the eyes of the Asia Pacific largely. But you know, we're titling it the EU the eyes of Australasia because Australia is our point of concern today. Now, uh, in terms of the geographical uh, coverage of the project, uh, it encompasses very many countries, uh, including, of course, you've got Australia here, uh, New Zealand, uh, and many other countries, the Asia Pacific region. We did some uh, research in 2007, 2008, and 2009, still ongoing in Kenya and South Africa, and now so how to spread uh, up towards Russia, and of course we're concentrating on uh, Australia and New Zealand. And uh, <coughs> in terms of partners and uh, sponsorships, the project is currently sponsored by the Asia Europe Foundation, the National Center for Research on Europe, the European Commission, and of course QC chipped in a couple of coins for us to make it easier by the Monash European and EU Center. Uh, and it began in 2005, largely with uh, four countries that uh, were there. So don't ask me a lot about the details. The only thing is there's a kind of snapshot of the kind of image that uh, we got at that particular time. And as you can see here, uh, you know, news coverage about the European Union in uh, the media, uh, including even in TV, were like neutral. That's, you couldn't tell in the news whether they were positive about the European Union or negative about the European Union. Uh, so it's like mentioning the European Union just like in a passing. Okay. Uh, and also, at that particular time, the image in general, you have to answer your question, was largely uh, political. And this was especially influenced by uh, the idea of the Europe's, uh, European Union's Enlightenment project, which was uh, extremely important at that time and significant. And that was in 2005 when the uh, project uh, began. Uh, but then, of course, we had various things here that are very important, largely the you know, political environment. 
uh, I mean, putting you know the economic aspects aside, etc. And of course, they also influence here. Uh, John Howard uh, is uh, my point of departure. May I say around here because uh, from him to Julia Gillard today, we've had a kind of uh, change within the political environment in uh, Australia. Uh, he wasn't uh, pro-European. I mean, that's uh, pro-EU that he's saying uh, largely. Of course, he made some of the comments, like the one you can see here, uh, like it is a mistake to see all uh, that's Australia's relations with major countries of the continent, that's European continent, through Brussels. So uh, Brussels is where, of course, the uh, headquarters of the, the European Union. Okay. And he viewed Australia as a victim of uh, you know, the world trading system in which the EU plays an important role. Uh, and, of course, uh, he blamed the European Union as the main perpetrator, and mostly these issues dealt with uh, things to do with the common agricultural policy of the European Union and the interplay, uh, the interplay between the uh, relations between them. And he preferred state-to-state -state, uh, relations. So we can see we could see more focus on, say, for example, the UK, Germany, etc., etc. So he found himself at one time uh, he was speaking to Schroeder. Uh, in Germany uh, over issues to do with the common agricultural policy. And Schroeder said, well, look, we are not in the wrong door because the common agricultural policy uh, is an EU-wide uh, uh, EU policy. Sticking points, as we know, uh, things to do with climate change. Okay, so he commented one time, <coughs> it is just another fuzzy preoccupation of urban liberals and the Greens. Okay? And of course, uh, he, uh, as we know, he, he you know, uh, the idea of the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions not in Australia's national uh, interest. So there are things you know better than I do, so for example, uh, much uh, better. And then things changed. 2007, uh, Kevin Murphy came in and he, uh, of course, renewed Australia's international engagement, okay, at least in a different way, redefining the national interest. Uh, and uh, you know, very important was the statement he made, in fact, at the very beginning when he, uh, when he became the Prime Minister, acting nationally now requires acting internationally. Uh, and of course, uh, in his first, uh, his first move uh, in office uh, was to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, which the Arab regime had been hesitant to do for a very long time. Uh, the human rights record, I think, we know very well uh, with relation to uh, the God's people. The Northern Territory intervention was a Howard government under Mal Broth okay, well, policy. Right. Yeah, but then now. Um, the editing. Yes, yeah, so I think I will edit it. Thank you very much for that. Okay. And also, he viewed Europe, of course, as a new foreign policy priority beyond trade. So he began discussing issues to do with uh, you know, security. Of course, security, Howard had also spoken about security, but not the way. Okay. Uh, uh, he could push it towards Australia going to, uh, to join the United Nations Security Council, etc., etc., and playing a bigger role in that. Okay. Uh, the governor finding herself uh, uh, in Africa lobbying for Australia to join the uh, European, uh, the, to join the United Nations Security Council, which has actually been effective because of the African war, of course. Issues of climate change, education, science, and uh, development, and of course the push for another framework agreement. Julia Gillard virtually continued the same engagement okay, with the international engagement. All right? And when she came in, Australia was just joining the ASEAN process, the Asia Europe meeting uh, process. Uh, her first international visit was, in fact, to Brussels. Uh, and Australia, of course, even at that particular time, she said, well, we need to kind of get into a new kind of agreement with the uh, European Union. I think from our discussions, uh, that's when we were in Canberra, uh, that agreement is being uh, prepared. So that's a kind of brief background uh, around which we have back to this project also again to revisit it uh, in uh, 2011, in which case, from a methodological perspective, uh, we got to do the media analysis, public opinion, and the lit interviews uh, in Australia. I'm interested in the media analysis, and this is what we're going to talk about. I'm not talking about public opinion or lead, uh, interviews, perhaps Abel might uh, touch on them. And in the media, we were interested in uh, 
these are our such words, the European Union could be the EU or the EU institutions. Okay? Uh, Europe, per se, uh, was not really part of what we looked for because we were interested in the element of the European Union, of course, we wanted to do that. Okay, so we looked at three newspapers, and one TV uh, news, uh, the, the, the bulletin uh, between January and June uh, 2011. In total, we collected 831 news items, okay, and New Zealand, of course, they collected 487. Uh, what we looked at were, uh, in Australia, the papers we looked at were the Australian, the Herald Sun, the Australian Financial Review, and, of course, for me it was pretty good because <laughs> there was an extra for me to see at which TV I uh, get the ABC News at 7 p.m. And uh, <clears throat> what did we find out? And I'll just give you a snapshot. Rather general, perhaps, might, might ask you, uh, uh, you to excuse me on this. Okay, so in terms of the monthly coverage uh, of the European Union in Australia, at least we had about 44 news items across the board in this period of six months. Okay, and TV news were also you know, very small, uh, five uh, in a month. Talking about the European Union. Here, of course, it does not mean the European Union was not being talked about in relation to the euro, the currency, and we put that aside because it's talked about every day, especially you know, the exchanges, etc., and in forex, so that kind of thing. We did not include that. And when you look at some of the popular, <coughs> uh, uh, the popular papers, okay, so this was the Australian and the Herald Sun okay, here, uh, you could see that uh, uh, they tended to dominate. But then we also had, I think, perhaps, uh, thanks to uh, your work, on the AVO team, uh, uh, there was a lot of coverage from the financial review, because so this is uh, a daily uh, TV news who are really extremely, extremely low. Uh, if I yes. can add, yes. uh, the, we called it invisibility because we compared it this time, which we hadn't done before in the previous right. research, with other actors, how Australian newspapers and television, how they cover, for example, China, India and the US. So the number of stories were hundreds of them yeah, a month. On the right. EU, the, the thing we were looking for, just a couple of them every month. Mm, okay. So, and then... Um, sources? Okay, in terms of sources, you know, let's continue because we don't have time. Okay, of the 831 uh, news items that we looked at here in Australia, only 28% 20, for example had international sources and largely uh, at the Fast one was Bloomberg, the New York Times, and the AFP. I mean, we can also see across the board how the uh, New Zealand uh, papers and the Chinese papers had. Like, say, for example, New Zealand up to up to 63%. So, uh, here again, that uh, is uh, an issue to consider in terms of the people who are available to work. In terms of the coverage, I mean, the centrality of the, of the news, you can see there that I've got minor. A secondary or major. I mean, these are news, uh, these are new, the kind of coverage where, say, for example, if it was minor, uh, then the E was mentioned in passing. It was, in, you know, it was just, yeah. Yes. And then uh, so maybe in the last sentence, as ever says, okay, if it was major, the whole news item was solely on the European Union, okay? And secondary could be, like, say, for example, an issue here in Australia. And we also picked substantially a bit uh, to cover the uh, European Union and all the elements in the net. Okay? And you can see most of the news, let's come back again, you know, coming that bit there, most of the news covered, okay, treated the European Union was largely like minor uh, in that perspective. Next. <clears throat> now, also, we looked at the uh, various sectors in which news covered. So, for example, it could be whether. Uh, the item was developmental, uh, that is, it did deal with issues to do with developing countries, uh, say, for example, EU in Fiji or uh, in Papua New Guinea or elsewhere. Uh, social issues, you know, health, etc. Uh, economic, you know, it is environmental or political. Uh, and here again, we could see that economic news also uh, dominated. Uh, environmental news, for which the EU is well known, were very, very. Were not go well covered. 
and also again the news here, especially in Australian newspapers, <clears throat> the state of the economy, as you mentioned, uh, were actually poor. So the Eurozone and the debt crisis was extremely dominant in the coverage. However, in China, the EU was covered largely you know, in terms of a trade partner and not uh, in terms of the crisis that uh, they had and did not see that much in uh, Australia and New Zealand. Um, in terms of <clears throat> the political aspects of it, the EU uh, was covered largely with its activities not inside uh, the EU itself, but outside of it, and it dealt with the Arab Spring. So that's the activities of the European Union, say, for example, in Libya, etc. Uh, if I can add to this, uh, the political messages about the EU were asking for the presence of the so we have to pick them up because they mentioned the word the European Union, but the, the articles were actually asking what is what are the great powers doing, what is the EU doing, the people of Libya are asking for help, where are they? So not exactly not, not necessarily that the EU was present and doing something, but at least it was mentioned uh, in the past. And here we come with the images that the only ones. Yes, <laughs> and these are the only ones the ones that dominated again uh, even on uh, on T V. I think we can see over right here. Uh, have a look at uh, is that of interest? <laughs> yeah, so we can look at his face. And, uh, so a lot of the news covered really dealt with the uh, situation of the as a particular crisis. So I think I'll stop there. We, we, that was the research done in 10 other countries in Asia Pacific, well, in Asia this time. And um, it was only in Australia where Europe was covered in terms of crisis. Nothing else was covered, yeah, just no, the crisis. Yeah, yeah. And we were asked to look for metaphors, for language, gymnastics, all sorts of things that describe. Uh, we had lots of other graphs, but we just deleted them for today. Uh, describing Europe in very negative terms. In uh, people in Asia said they are not even aware what a metaphor is because their languages do not have such things in, in the language. So, so it was only in Australia that it was very visible. Even by the selection of pictures, I can imagine that every newspaper gets. Uh, hundreds of pictures from Reuters every day, but the one you pick to publish in your newspaper is different. This again did not happen in Asian countries because you had lots of handshakes and smiles and all sorts of factories going or not. Not a troubled prime minister symbolizing a troubled country. So this was not the issue in other countries. We can again argue what's newsworthy in Australia, what's newsworthy in China. We all know that Chinese media are controlled and state managed. And in Australia, they have the free choice to choose whatever they want, but why so many and why just this? So we were wondering how, what is the EU doing to actually help the Australian journalists or media anywhere in the world to understand itself and how it's developing its policy towards, well, communication policy. And I Do you want to follow on from, from Patrick here? Could I? Because I just yeah, yeah, you can. And you I can. Have because we're of course dying to know, you know, why it is that Australia made these choices in terms of coverage. <laughs> That's such an easy question to ask. Uh, this is what I would like to find out from the journalists today, maybe from you, Johan. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so we jumped on the plane and we went to Brussels to actually ask what it is that you guys are doing for people to understand you, because it's a, it's a new project. Australia sees Europe through the national lens. We had a discussion about identities, about languages, and really, the, Australia understands Europe as a bunch of countries, not as the integrated project or a country called <coughs> Europe, which when you come from Europe, there's so much happening, so much integration everywhere. It touches you in absolutely every aspect of your life, so you know it's there. In Australia, you don't know it. We had people coming on Erasmus Mundus this this year, some of them came from the Czech Republic, for example. They were, I would imagine, the Czech Republic as a developing country, and we asked them, how are you coping with this crisis? And they said, what crisis? <laughs> so so ob uh, obviously the crisis is not that visible to them. They don't complain about unemployment. A French girl was scared after three months of sitting here. She was scared of going back to France. She said, maybe they have fallen apart. <laughs> so that was her idea for after watching Australian media. So we had a difficult job because when you look at, let's call it a country called Europe, what do you look at? Usually countries have things to communicate with the rest of the world. A normal country <laughs> would have a foreign minister or a face of that country. It would have a message.
to spread around and it have some, some means, some kind of media instruments. So this has been known under the national, as, as a domain of nation states. If we see Julia, if we see Hillary, we know who they speak for. We would not confuse Hillary with a Chinese message. That's, that's not going to happen. We know who she speaks, or on whose behalf she speaks. If we talk about media, they are also very national media. We have the ABC communicating Australia to the Asia Pacific. It doesn't have to be the center-owned medium. It doesn't have to be a, center, uh, not center, a state-owned <coughs> newspaper like in China or news agency. But at least it delivers Chinese message or Australian message, so it's not confused whose message is coming from CCTV or from ABC, Australian ABC. So these are the things which are problematic to look at when you look at such a thing, such an animal as the EU. They are not a state, they don't have those things, but we tried to discover a few things. And we discovered that as the communication became like here, the domain of women, so you put a woman in place and she'll get the job done for you, right? <laughs> they nominated a woman to be their foreign minister. The story has been very long coming from the very beginning, but this is the latest, the latest thing. They have a minister who is supposed to be spreading the message. What, what's the message? They think they have to facilitate democracy, peace, and prevention of conflict economic and environmental de development, and they have, have also have to manage global natural resources. This is all on top of things that they had before, external trade, uh, development aid. They have ministers, they have them for, forever. So this, the, the new thing only manages political things. And we also spoke to people in Europe about what it is that they would like the world to see. So they told us, we want them to see that we are the largest trading bloc, the largest economic power, despite the issues that we have with the, with the troubled countries. We want them to know that we are the largest donor of international aid, that we are a trailblazer when it comes to climate action, and uh, that we have the most ambitious targets when it comes to curbing emissions and renewable energy. So we are, we feel very confident, very strong on the international scene, yet we knew this is not what's seen in Australia in Australian newspapers. So we have the message, we have the foreign minister to promote it. This would be in a nutshell the message, the, the stuff of the legend that they would like to promote for everywhere. I grouped it into many different, but this is, this has come from many different uh, well, documents and uh, interviews with, with people. This is what they want to sell. They are not selling it in Australia, that's for sure. How are they thinking they are selling things. They have embarked on a project to communicate themselves. They are investing a lot into something that Australia already has, broadcasting newspapers. They are establishing European newspapers, not German, not French, not Italian, but so what is it that they have come up with? They have come up with things that are available for free. Uh, journalists in Australia do not know about them. They have audiovisual service, Europe by satellite, things which are available for free. Um, you just have to click, click on something. So th there's free footage, something like a Reuters um, agency 